everyone, Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb. You know, this is the part of the video where I usually flap my lips for a few minutes to tell you what's coming. But in this case, I'm just gonna step out of the frame and let you see for yourself. In case you haven't seen it, this is the Pipistrel Panthera. And not to be too shamelessly promotional about it or anything, it's the best looking, sleekest airplane in general aviation at the moment, and well, maybe ever. If you follow the project, you know that it's been a long time in the gestation. I first flew the Panthera prototype in Slovenia way back in 2014. And what you see behind me is the first pre-production version to appear in the US. Still not certified, however, that's a work in progress. This particular airplane is an experimental exhibition category meant to be a demonstrator for the U.S. market. Certification is still underway and is at least a year, maybe a year and a half away. This version of the airplane is quite a bit different from the first prototype, mainly for having a different engine, the Lycoming IO540, rather than the IO390 that was originally planned. I'm in Inverness, Florida at the moment, that's just north of Tampa, and it's where Wright Rudder Aviation is. They're gonna be the US dealer for the Panthera, and Andy Chan is gonna give us a walk around first, and we'll take the thing flying. And yes, we're gonna be wearing masks, so don't get your pants snagged. I ate them too. Uh, as we discussed, this is the brand new, highly anticipated 2020 Pipistrel Panthera, and one of the biggest changes is the power plant. Uh, originally, the airframe was designed around the Lycoming uh, IO390 engine, a great engine, uh, but ultimately it was not certified and not anticipated to be certified for use for automotive fuel. Uh, Pipistrel is a worldwide company, and as such, it is very concerning uh, the availability of 100 low leaded. And so uh, the ability to accept automotive fuel as a use of an approved fuel is very important to worldwide customers. Because of that, the power plant was changed for the Lycoming IO390 to the Lycoming IO540, uh, a variant that is approved for use with automotive fuel. So it's 260 horsepower. Uh, it is a six cylinder moving from the four cylinder. Uh, it did require quite a lot of re-engineering on the front end. The cowling out exterior was pretty much the same, but interior with respect to cooling especially, they've placed a lot of thought into the cowling inlets and uh, the outlets f in addition to the cooling plenum that remain inside. So 540 is an excellent power plant choice. It's uh, got, a, got a great uh, reliable history and uh, parts are everywhere, everyone knows how to work on it and uh, great engine choice. And as you'll see, it performs very well in this airframe. Uh, the propeller is an empty propeller, specifically designed by Pipistrel for this airframe. When they were selecting a propeller, uh, they ran into two issues. You could find a propeller for aircraft that are high speed, but high displacement engines or uh, lower speed with a similar displacement engine. But it was unusual to find uh, a propeller that would do 200 knots on this particular power plant. So that's why Pipistrel ended up designing the propeller for this aircraft. The aircraft itself, uh, you're probably already familiar with it, is an all composite, mainly carbon fiber structure. Very, very strong, uh, well known throughout the aviation industry at this point. Even, uh, of course, the 787 uh, popularized the use of composite structures. So very well known. Um, it, the aircraft itself has some great, great features. Um, really, the main point of it is, a, is a, to be the ultimate personal travel machine. So uh, four seats, 1,100 pound useful load, 1,000 nautical mile range and 200 knots are the specifications on it. And that's an incredible feat to achieve all in one aircraft. Uh, part of the way they do it is with the unique retractable gear system. It does have a titanium trailing link landing gear, so it makes all your landings look good, very, very strong and robust, uh, and does meet that Part 23 uh, certification requirement. So um, excellent landing gear system. Uh, going back, one topic I forgot to go over on the engine itself was uh, the, when you hear the engine, you'll hear, you've probably heard a lot of 540s in the past in the various types of airframes. On this airframe, it's probably the quietest you've ever heard. In Europe and throughout the world, uh, noise pollution is very important, and so they've really maximized the efficiency of the exhaust and tuned it uh, for maximum power output of the engine, but also minimal noise. And they did that with an Enconel exhaust system. 
Uh, for those of you don't, who don't know, that's a super metal that is primarily reserved for use in turbine uh, engines. Uh, in this case, they've used it on a general aviation aircraft, again, for that engine tuning and performance. Walking around the aircraft, you can see it's a very slick airframe. Looking underneath, for example, there are no uh, flap hinges or things like that. Very much uh, minimized drag in every instance where possible. Um, so you'll see extremely, ex extremely slick surfaces. Uh, going up to the gap seals and things of that nature, very, very tight tolerances compared to other manufacturers. And that's part of what achieves the efficiency of the airframe is, um, you know, you can do a cr economy cruise at 185 knots and 11 gallons per hour, and that's because of how slick the airframe is. Uh, continuing around the aircraft, one of the unique safety features, or not unique, one of the great safety features on the Panthera is it, the Panthera has been spin tested, enters and exits spins reliably and readily but it also, for peace of mind and additional safety, is equipped with a full airframe ballistic parachute recovery system. And uh, that, of course, is only to be used in extreme emergency as a last resort, but it is there if you do need to, if you do need to use it. And it also has a very high maximum de deployment speed of 195 knots. So uh, while we do advise slowing down prior to pulling a parachute, if it is so required, uh, you're able to pull it at a high speed if necessary as well. The interior of the aircraft was designed for safety and comfort in mind. Uh, the entire cabin enclosure is, con is built uh, with strength in mind in the event of an incident or an accident. Uh, so it's got a lot more robust carbon fiber than in other parts of the aircraft, again, to protect the safety of the occupants. And because carbon fiber, if you were to break, take it and push it beyond its breaking point, it would create shards, uh, which could be dangerous to the occupants because of that. Uh, the use of Kevlar is, is, uh, con is throughout, throughout the cabin. There's a lot of Kevlar overlaid on that composite structure, and Kevlar is widely known for being utilized in bulletproof vests where it can protect those types of shards. So uh, you have strength from carbon fiber, and then you have protection from the Kevlar that, uh, if that ca carbon fiber does shatter. Getting into and out of the Panthera is a bit of an art. It's daunting on the first try. But no need to step on those nice leather seats. Just lead with the right foot and use the cabin frame and glare shield grip for support. To egress, lever yourself out and reverse the process. For heavy or out of shape people, this is not gonna be a picnic. Entering the rear cabin is easy, but you need to be cognizant of the doors overhead or you'll bash your noggin like I did. Measured cabin width is 47 inches at the shoulders or a bit wider than the Mooney Acclaim, but skinnier than a Cirrus. The rear is a little less at 45 inches. Headroom is a couple of inches. You won't crowd your headset on the glass unless you're really tall. The seats slide fore and aft over a limited range, but they don't recline. In the rear, there's about 15 inches of footwell room. Before I get to more details, price. The experimental version of the Panthera is priced at around $639,000. Certified version at about $672,000. And here, cue the usual gas about high airplane prices. I know it's a reflexive response, so get it out of your systems. That certified price, if it holds, is comparable, but a little less than a Cirrus SR22 base price. Now look at some details, starting with the landing gear. It's electrically operated, similar to Mooney's and Bonanza's, with a center-mounted motor working through a transmission, rods, and tubes. There's a lot going on here. There are 11 doors total, including inner doors that not all retractables have. So when the gear is up, as you can see in this photo, the underside is absolutely slick, and the fit and finish on all the doors and panels appears to be just flawless. The main gear is trailing link with oleo struts with major components fabricated of titanium, which is light and corrosion resistant. I'll draw your attention to this door, which has a sculpted compound curve, typical of the shapes throughout the airplane. That tells me this is not a cheap or easy airframe to manufacture. In flight, the gear cycle time felt slow, and it is, about nine seconds compared to three seconds in a Mooney. This is something to keep in mind if you ever have to land on remaining runway because of an emergency after retracting the wheels. In other words, don't retract the gear too soon after rotation. 
The flaps are two-thirds span with two settings, and they're also electrically operated. The gaps are similarly flawless, and here's another compound shape on a stub flap section under the wing walks. This is actually a nice detail that means occupants can board the airplane without trashing the top of the flaps. With all this attention to drag reducing tight gaps, I expected to see a lot of gap tape, but the only place it's used is apparently on the underside of the elevator. The Panthera has a respectably light empty weight of about 1,810 pounds on a gross weight of 2,900 pounds. Call that a useful load of 1,100 pounds. There are two fuel tank options, one with 55 gallons and one with 91 gallons. The larger tanks boost the gross weight to an even 3,000 pounds. Here's how the Panthera compares to the competition in useful load. It's about the middle of the pack, but keep in mind it's dimensionally the smallest of all these airframes. The Panthera has a generous 9-inch center of gravity envelope, according to the POH, and if that's accurate, it's pretty hard to load it out of the CG range. For my flight with Andy Chan, the CG was an inch aft of the forward limit. If I reload it with heavy people in the back seats, it's three inches forward of the aft limit, and adding 100 pounds of baggage puts the airplane 50 pounds over gross weight, but it's still in the CG limit. Now on to flying the thing. But first, you gotta taxi it, and right away what gets your attention is how high the glare shield is, and that big structural post right down the center of the windshield. Why is this so? Well, back to the front view. Mooney brags about having low frontal drag, but the Panthera must certainly be even less. To achieve that, you sit almost reclined and low in the airframe, and all the structure, including the glare shield, slopes together to the front. As a result, when taxiing, you can't see immediately in front of the airplane, especially when making a right taxi turn. It takes some adaptation. While I'm talking about taxiing, Air condition is planned as an option, but I'm not sure I'd trade it for the weight hit. With those two gull wing doors open, you get a cooling blast right off the prop. It was quite comfortable for me. On the takeoff roll, the restricted view forward is no big deal because you should be looking downrange anyway. Same on landing. To scan for traffic during climb, you'll either need to S-turn a little or lower the nose occasionally. And speaking of climb, the Panthera rocks that at about 1,500 feet per minute initial. Maybe a little more. However, the IO540 is tightly cowled, and I'm guessing it's right at the limits for climb cooling. They're kind of warm running above 400, all of them. Yep, that's why I recommend the 130 knot cruise. So yeah. that's another thing that um, I've worked very hard on, I know. Of course, it's not the coolest of days, but the aircraft needs to be able to fly in all conditions. I saw cylinder head temperatures over 400 degrees, and I don't care what Lycoming says about 500 degrees being the limit, that's just too hot. So you need a higher speed climb and a lower rate to keep the engine cool. If airplanes fly like they look, well, the Panthera is the poster child for that. The center stick makes maneuvering sporty and precise, but I did notice with that sharply angled glare shield, it's kind of hard to form a sight picture for a level, steep turn. A little practice would fix that. There's only minor trim changes when the flaps and gear are operated, and trim, by the way, is electric through a pair of anti-servo tabs on the elevator. For the panel, the Panthera has the Garmin G3X Touch and a GTN 650-750 combination. The autopilot can be equipped with Garmin's ESP envelope protection, but it doesn't have that yet. It's a planned addition. One gadget I really like in this airplane is this sub-panel just forward of the throttle. If you push the gear test button, it toggles the climate control data to give you a quick summary of gear, flap, and fuel status. Uh, while we're climbing, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the avionics here. We're looking at the G3X Touch. Uh, we got the 750, uh, GTN 750, 650 combination. Yep. Any, any other options? Uh, no, this is pretty much stock, and these are the XI versions of the 750 and 650. Um, one thing that Pipistrel does is they did put in dual AHRs behind, 
one behind each V3X. And of course, at the centerpiece here, we also have as a backup the Mid-Continent Mid -continent Instrument SAM, which is known for its reliability and stability. Uh, and it also has its own independent battery backup system. Uh, on top of that, we do have a secondary emergency battery uh, as needed. So, avionics-wise, very well equipped. It has, does have the Garmin Autopilot and the Garmin GTX 345 remote transponder as well to get that ADS-B in and out. Now on to the important part. Is this a 200-knot airplane? Well, no. Not quite. At least not yet. The draft POH isn't fully fleshed out, but the highest speed given is 194 knots at 10,000 feet. I didn't take the airplane that high, but at 6,000 and 8,000 feet, the Panthera does pretty much what the POH says it should. It's not turbocharged, so the sweet spot is likely to be about here. At 8,000 feet, the book says 183 knots at 13 gallons, and I recorded 184 knots at that fuel flow, and that was on an ISO plus 30 degree day. It was pretty hot. Despite the hot day, the cylinder head temperatures cooled to under 400 degrees in cruise. So hot day climbs may be the only worry here. Here's how it compares to typical cruise speeds for other airplanes in the class. Now there's necessarily some apples and oranges in this comparison because three of the airplanes are turbocharged and three aren't. The fastest in this class is the Mooney Acclaim, but the Panthera edges out everything else at realistic cruise speeds and fuel flows. It's not blow the doors off faster, it's incrementally faster. Sure, you can twiddle the power settings to vary this ranking, but another way of comparing these airplanes is by specific range, or the distance an airplane travels per unit of fuel consumed. Here the Panthera is an easy first among the gasoline airplanes at 2.4 nautical miles per pound of fuel. Only the Diamond DA50RG does better than that at a specific range of 3, and it has a turbocharged diesel. Also, as you might imagine, specific range is a rough hack on cabin size because a big cabin has more frontal area and more drag, so it takes more fuel to push it along. So practically, will the Panthera do the imaginary 1,000 mile trip from my home base in Florida to that other imaginary place in Wisconsin where a big air show used to be. Yes, it will, but only with three people and some baggage. With four people, you'll need a pretty good tailwind or a fuel stop in Illinois. Now on to the fun part, landings. They're fun because you get to yank and bank and the Panthera excels at that. Also, frankly, a student pilot can land this airplane and a student pilot with practice can land it well. The trailing link gear soaks up bounces and once planted on the runway, the airplane stays planted. Pipistrel doesn't plan to equip the Panthera with speed brakes and because the gear operating limit is 106 knots, you have to plan ahead when descending into the pattern. VFE is also 106 knots. In the pattern, the view out the left window on base leg is fantastic. And this is the view from eye level on approach. 75 knots is the recommended approach speed, but if I were flying the airplane regularly, I'd experiment with slower speeds over the fence. The Panthera floats some if it's too fast, and slower speeds would reduce that. For a moment or two on touchdown, it's a little like a tail dragger with limited view of the runway. But once the nose comes down, the view improves. POH has no takeoff and landing data yet, but I think I'd be okay with a 2,500-foot obstacle-free runway. So in the end, what do we have here? Best case, it's a work in progress. The airplane is some distance from certification, and we don't have final performance numbers and weights. For example, what's air conditioning going to weigh? How about TKS or other anti-icing gear? Stay tuned for that. We can't judge it just yet. For now, the Panthera is a competent airplane. Like every other airplane, it has some warts. It's not the fastest, but it's fast enough. And except for Diamond's diesel, it's the most efficient. And it doesn't carry the most, but it carries enough. In this class, it's by far the most fun flying airplane. And if you like sports cars and fast motorcycles, the Panthera is gonna be your jam. But don't take my word for it. 
You can find a full review of the Panthera in the November 2020 issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine. <laughs> well, I wrote the article, so I guess you will have to take my word for it. But hey, cheer up. 2020 is almost over.